Actually, I'm I'm coming. Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen. I'm gonna act like I'm speaking to a huge crowd on live stream. It's good to see you over there. Yeah. Great to see all our visitors, good to see you. Oh. Okay, anybody have it? We're gonna, we'll sing a song or two because traditionally I do not take up that much time. Uh, Pastor Joe does, but I don't, so you. <laughs> You can borrow some from that next time, and you can have it. So we'll sing a song or two. But after we take some prayer requests or praises tonight, oh, I'm supposed to give announcements about the youth group. So several decisions have been made already. As of 1 o'clock today, they were still alive in football. I think they actually might have lost after that, but I don't know. Still alive in football, basketball, volleyball. And soccer for guys. Do you have an update on which ones are still in? On everything except football. Okay, so they lost in football. And the girls were going to play, but they had to depend on two girls to show up. I guess that's from another church, but they never showed up, so they lost. So they're still doing good. Any other updates that you guys have heard? I just make it a point not to. My kid's alive. It's okay, sounds good to me. Um, so keep praying for them, uh, pray for, especially the ones that have, that's their first time, uh, there, uh, pray for that whole family, Salim, Sadiq, Samir, the whole family's up there, I don't know if that's the first time that they've all been up there? Yeah, I think everybody's, yeah. Salim's first time, okay, that's cool, yeah, we were saying how much, now their mom has a week off, and then my wife said, you guys also have a quiet week, right, with empty house? <laughs> We actually pretty quiet now. We have a thirteen year old who is a little bit loud, so we're good. Uh, so keep praying for Bill, the ranch campers. Anything else out there? This is just an unspoken request. Show unspoken. Kind of car you're looking for? Toyota Camry. Toyota Camry. Don't have one. Yes. Um, I just pray for me. I'm getting over a double kidney infection. Oh. And also, I have one of those um, impossible ones that won't. Did you say impossible unspoken? I was going to say, I didn't, I've never heard the official title of that, but. Yeah. Or anything else? Dr. Hand. It's working on me, and I'm uh, needing it, and I appreciate it. Long-suffering, God's spirit. Joe, I'm actually going to have you pray, but I know you haven't been taking these notes. Um, so, ranch campers, you have your own unspoken. Ryan was in the car. Elizabeth with double kidney infection. And an impossible unspoken. I'll give you time to catch up. That's okay. And then Mr. Ham, that the Lord is working on him. You know, we're all thankful for that. Amen. Amen. Sir. You can take that in different ways. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? You guys have all recovered. You're good. 
you and Ty? Recover from? You guys, a couple weeks ago, or maybe that was longer the travel stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. we're doing all right. Okay. She's uh, in the painful stage of shots uh, for her treatment, well, the eye treatment. Um, and so just pray for her. She just started yesterday. She had her second shot today. And uh, it's, it's not comfortable. I mean, injecting uh, some oil into the deep muscle tissue. She's got to do it herself? You can praise the Lord for our family. We had a great trip to Honduras, and thankfully nobody got sick while we were there. Um, several were saved from a, a public school that came to a clinic, heard the gospel. Uh, one was saved, I think, actually from the church, and then it was just refreshing. It was a good week. My kids absolutely loved it, and the older two want to earn, earn money from now until next summer so they can go again. So. All right, that's it. Pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be together tonight. Thank you for the encouragement, the boost that it is to be together in church for worship and for fellowship with you. Lord, I pray for tonight that you give your blessing. Thank you for Pastor Johnson. Lord, I pray that you give him wisdom and grace to keep his message in our hearts and help us. Lord, I pray for We just thank you again for these young ladies who were saved on Sunday. We praise you for working in their lives. We just thank you, Lord, for just the number of people that we've seen get saved and make good decisions here in recent months, just the way that you're definitely at work here at Connect. And we praise you for that. We pray that you would continue to do just life-changing things here in our community and in our hearts as well here at International. Lord, I do pray for this request that's on my Kimberly's heart and mind tonight. Wise and strong. Thank you for your wisdom in that need. I pray that you be glorified there. We thank you that Elizabeth is improving. I pray that you continue to help her as she recovers. I do pray for this impossible unspoken request that she has, Lord. I pray that you would just help her to be strong in faith and to bring this before you specifically and boldly and to confidently trust you that you're well able to do these things. Lord, I thank you that nothing is impossible with you. that we think are impossible, that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. So we pray that for this need, Lord, that you would work in such a way that you just put your power and your ability and your wisdom on display. I pray for Ryan and Callie and the needs that they have. I pray that you would be gracious to provide the transportation needs there. Lord, for Tasia, I pray that you'd provide just a great newer car for them that would meet their needs more long term. Lord, for the way that you're working in Brother Holly's life, I pray that you'd continue to do that, to keep teaching him. Lord, I pray for that same desire for the rest of us, that we would be truly seeking you to work in our lives, that we'd be transparent, honest, and open with you about the ways that we need to be changing, the ways we need to be learning and growing. May there be a spirit of that here at this church, just a, a desire that permeates the, the folks here. Drew and for time, Lord, that you just be gracious to them and the needs that you've given them. There are a lot of ways that they're having to just depend on you and trust you right now. We pray that you be gracious to Tyra and Nell with these treatments. Be gracious with the discomfort and the pain. Help her to endure. Help her to trust you. Lord, I pray for just the un-
uncertainty that they're facing with pregnancy and having children. I just pray that they would honor you as they, as they glorify you in their responses and that you would be pleased to answer their heart's desires. Lord, a lot of prayer from them and from us and others that you'd be pleased to bless them, their children. Lord, we just thank you for your wisdom and your ability there. Pray for Drew, Lord, to give him wisdom and job hunting. Be gracious to him as he continues to look. Lord, you know their needs and we thank you that you have already promised to meet their needs so you have this totally under control. Just give Drew wisdom as he looks for each next step and as he trusts you. I pray that you guide his steps and lead him into just the right job. Lord, a place where he can thrive and where he can do well but definitely meet their needs. A place where he can have a ministry in other people's lives even. So just be gracious to them, Lord. We do pray for Mrs. Pelletier tonight. Lord, be gracious to her. Please protect her. Obviously with her fragile health, we just pray that you allow her to be able to rest and begin to really recover. We thank you for Brother Mike and his ministry to her. And I pray that you allow him to really be helpful to her and be an encouragement to him also if we need. So please protect her, Lord. I pray that soon she'll be able to be back with us. And I pray that you would allow her health to improve such that she'd be able to be with us more often and with such an encouragement and blessing to her just thank you for her faith. Thank you for her endurance. And the way she just sweetly plugs along and trusts you, even with all these limitations. I pray that you allow her increased ministry opportunities, even with her limited health. And that you'd be pleased to continue giving her ways to serve you. And that you'd use her and encourage her that way. Lord, we do thank you also for bringing the washers back safely. Thank you for their trip to Honduras. Thank you for this good report opportunities they had to preach the gospel to those who got saved. Lord, we pray for those who are yet unsaved, who heard the gospel, that you would just continue to bless that seed sown in their heart. Please protect from uh, Satan creating distractions or doing other things to take that seed away and to draw their heart and mind away from what they heard. I pray that the Spirit of God would just continue to draw those souls to you and more people would yet be saved. Again, Lord, we just pray your blessing on tonight. Thank you for allowing us to have some time together. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, somebody grab a hymnal and... Uh... Yeah, well, most of us will know it, but maybe we can make this our theme song for the next two weeks. Oh, yes. Yes, that'd be great. 4-12. Four 4-12. Twelve. Four twelve. You're the winner. Yeah. It is. <laughs> I'm not supplying it though, but you'll find it.
Let me start by saying this. How did I come to this topic, victory over fear? Because as far as I know, we have not discussed this um, in the last few years of uh, Chase for Victory. Uh, it's because we started this semester, um, it was our first semester in, of traveling uh, to do prisons in about two years. And uh, so I, there was a lot of things that I didn't know what was coming up. I feel like I had to start over on how to do tournaments, and I began to just sense there was a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry, and so I came to a verse that we're actually not going to talk about necessarily today, but we'll talk about it next week, and uh, it's 2 Timothy, and you've heard this many times before, 2 Timothy chapter 1, just reading, I came across where it says, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And I began to realize that a lot of the fear that I was experiencing was not uh, given by God. All right, there's a difference, and we're going to see all that as we go through this. And so that set me on a journey to start studying. As you've heard before, people will say there's 365 times where God says, don't fear, don't be afraid. And, and so I wanted to, you know, prove that, and I wanted to do some looking up the word fear. So just started digging into the word fear, the word afraid fearful, whatever, wherever I could find it. And so these two weeks come out of that study of just coming from that one verse, God has not given us a spirit of fear. I wanted to see what the Bible said about fear. And let me tell you, uh, I've come to the realization there's a lot more fear <laughs> that I have um, after reading all these verses that I realized before. Um, and God, is not, God has not given us that. Okay? A lot of that fear does not come from the Lord. Obviously, it comes from us. So, let's start at the very beginning. Are you going to be able to do my PowerPoint, too? Can you double team? Like, you don't need to do it now. I don't think I'm moving yet, but um, I don't have it in front of me, so hopefully I remember where, <laughs> where the, it turns, okay? Um, let's look first at the fear, what def the definition of fear is, um, just by given by the dictionary, okay? Fear is defined as an emotion aroused by threatening evil or impending pain, all right? Accompanied by a desire to avoid or escape such pain, right? Uh, or it could be apprehension or dread. I think we all know what fear is, and we're going to dive into um, what fear is. Okay, psychologists, what we're going to do first, we're just going to go over what fear technically is, okay? Uh, because I think it's actually kind of fun to study some of the way our body works. So psychologists have determined there's only two fears that we're born with. Does anybody think they know one of them? Close. The fear of falling. Same thing, right? Okay. So that's one of them. That's what we're born with, supposedly, according to psychologists. I don't know how they know that, but there you go. Uh, what would be another one? Mm, no. I didn't make it up. Psychologists say it, so you're wrong. Failure. Right. Say what? Fear of failure. No, a fear of, uh, of loud noises. <laughs> I guess that makes sense, right? Yeah, so loud noises and the fear of falling. If you don't learn anything else tonight, you can go out here smart knowing what two things you were born with, okay? Let's dig into what fear actually is because this is interesting, okay? Fear is, ex this is all, I may have to read some of this because I don't plan on memori memorizing how fear actually works, okay? So uh, fear obviously is experienced in your mind. It triggers a strong physical reaction in your body, okay? You know this. If somebody, my wife hates this, she hates being scared, okay? If I ever scare her. She hates it, okay? So what happens as soon as you, as you recognize fear, see if I can say this word right, your amygdala, the small organ in the middle of your brain goes to work, okay? It alerts your nervous system, which sets your body's fear response into motion, okay? Hormones like cortisol and adrenaline are then released. Now, all this is happening very quickly. Your blood pressure, your heart rate increases, and you start breathing faster, your blood flow changes, Blood actually flows away from your heart into your limbs, which makes it easier for you to do that fight and flight thing, okay? So you walk outside and it's dark and someone wants to freak you out in your bushes. What happens? As soon as they scare you, all that stuff that I just said happens right away and you get scared and you start, okay, if you walk through a spider web, right? Same thing, you're freaked out at spiders and so you start doing stuff and you're not really controlling yourself. You don't know what's happening. Your body is just kind of naturally going into that position, okay? So as parts of your brain are revving up, other parts of your brain are shutting down. So uh, the cerebral cortex becomes impaired, so now it's difficult to make good decisions or think clearly, which is why, again, 
you do some really dumb stuff when you're scared. You just turn on YouTube and you can look at videos of people being scared and they do really stupid stuff because it's just all about getting away from whatever that is, okay? Um, you might throw your hands up or scream, whatever, because it's just what your body's doing. Now, some people actually, fear is a pleasure to them, okay? My wife loves roller coasters. Did you know she likes roller coasters? So people love... I don't understand people that love making themselves sick. I guess she doesn't get sick, but uh, she loves roller coasters. And so people who love that, like, go to a haunted house or something and then give themselves that fear, it's like a pleasure then because it actually does, uh, when you're scared, there's a chemical that comes from that called dopamine. Sound familiar? <laughs> okay. So that gets a little addicting, all right? So uh, that's why uh, people like to scare themselves. Uh, we get addicting, okay? Now, fear is naturally, biologically good for us in some ways, okay? Uh, there are things that you should fear, and we're going to talk about that, all right? You should fear uh, doing some stupid stuff, crossing the street, and some things that you should fear with your kids, okay? But even as we talked uh, last year about habits, sometimes we have to determine what is good and what is bad, Okay, so fear, and if you fear something good, if you fear getting killed, that's why you're not going to, you know, cross the street without looking. Okay, that's a good fear. But when you obsess over that, and you, like, constantly fear that your children are going to do that and run across, the, I mean, you see that there, we're going to determine that there's a, there's a line to be drawn. Is that making sense? We're going to see there's, you can't obsess over that. And I'll be honest with you, there are things that sometimes I lay in my bed at night and I fear what's going to happen to my kids when it's irrational. It shouldn't be taking place because it's, it's not happening. Okay? It's, not, it's not happening. So, uh, but there is a certain fear that keeps you safe. Okay? When, it's about, when it's about heights, okay? I shouldn't walk out that. You know, I shouldn't climb that rock face because you know, I've seen those things, I don't, know, I don't know, anywhere on TV, whatever, YouTube, whatever, where those guys will climb rock faces without ropes. Okay? That makes me start sweating just looking at that. Okay, that's naturally a good fear to have. Okay, Joe is not going to start climbing because he's a little afraid that he's going to fall. That's a great fear. Great fear. Okay, let that drive you not to do something foolish. All right. So, for the sake of us in our studies, uh, I've broken fear up into three types. Okay, three types of fear. Um, Drew, if you want to switch to the first one. So there is a, you don't have, oh, I can do it. Amazing. And you came in just in time. Which, look at that. Amazing. You're a blessing. All right, so uh, three types of fear. We have uh, consistent fear. All right. Um, this I would call a phobia. And we've talked about a couple of these already. All right. What do I mean by consistent fear? Their uh, phobias kind of break up into five broad categories, okay? And you probably have one of these phobias, right? Uh, there are fear of certain animals, all right? My wife, she sees a spider anywhere else in the world. She will climb things and throw things and run away. But this was just last week in Honduras because I guess she thought she's on a mission trip. She would allow that thing to crawl up her. That is a tarantula, and uh, I have a video of it, but I didn't bring that. So she only lasted <laughs> for a couple seconds, and then she said, no, thank you. So um, all the kids held it. We're not worried about it biting us, even though they said it could. But anyway, so uh, who has a phobia of spiders? Arachnophobia, right? Is that okay? So fierce. Now, I'm going to ask you what fear you have, but you have to pick one big one, okay? You can't have a fear of all of these, right? <laughs> Otherwise... <laughs> Okay, so there's a fear of animals, dogs, bugs, uh, they're called zoophobias, fear of bats, lizards, snakes, okay, all of these have names, herpetophobia, okay, how about a fear of heights, you there, okay, this is at the Grand Canyon, uh, you can walk out on glass, Mr. Harris says no, okay, uh, interesting, when I looked up uh, these type of glass walkways, you know where most of them are found? China. <laughs> the biggest ones are found in China. But uh, yeah, some of them just go straight down 700 feet to the bottom. So 
if you got a fear of heights, you're not going to go out on that, right? So that's a phobia. Uh, it's a consistent fear. In other words, whenever you're in that position, there's going to be some sweat involved, and there's going to be some heart racing. There's going to be, you know, you're going to have lots of dopamine at that point if Mr. Harris is standing right there, okay? Um, this is mine. Okay, I was just talking to Mrs. Lucas about this. All right, I cannot stand doctors and nurses. No offense to all the, there's such blessings, everybody else, but don't come at me with a needle and tell me this is not going to hurt, okay? It's not going to hurt. I've destroyed many a doctor's office, okay? I've destroyed one doctor's office from one visit with a, I could tell you that story later, but they don't want me to come back, so. Uh, anybody with me on that medical stuff? Oh, now I feel bad, like nobody else has problems. <laughs> Obviously you don't, you're the one over there giving shots, so. Um, how about public speaking? Um, yeah, public speaking, okay. Mr. Lucas, public speaking, all right. Um, flying, okay, that's part of height. I think that's a little different. Heights and flying, I think, are different. I'm not afraid of, like, being high. I'm afraid of this. Just the up and down in the stomach, and yeah, I don't, I don't like that. So. Uh, everybody have, you pick out one, okay, those are called phobias, in other words, those are consistent fears. Now, again, this is me breaking it down into these categories, okay, this is not, you know, biblical or scientific or whatever, this is me just kind of breaking it up. Oh, there's one more in here, anybody fear clowns? That's interesting, when I did some research, people are afraid of clowns. They're afraid of clowns, all right? Uh, they say that's a phenomenon known as de-individuation, which means that you can't see who they are, so it freaks you out. They're hiding behind a mask. Now let's get into the actual Bible part, okay? Enough fun, enough making some fun of ourselves. Let me give you a couple definitions. Uh, as I went through and perused a bunch of verses when it had to do with fear and being afraid, let me just give you a couple definitions. And I, you could come up with more definitions, okay? But this is just me saying, okay, looking through all these and uh, thinking about, number one, um, biblical fear uh, is, is, a, is being slow, to or refusing to obey a general or specific command of God based upon real or perceived consequences. Okay, now we're going to come back to the other two types of fear, okay? I'm just kind of breaking this up because these next two types of fear are more what we're going to look at when it comes to the Bible. Okay, phobias, they're kind of just out there, but these next two types of fear I think would fall into these categories, okay? Biblical fear is being slow to or refusing to obey a general or specific command of God based upon real or perceived consequences, okay? Let's just take, an, uh, take one, uh, for instance, and we're eventually going to come to this. Let's just talk about Joshua. Remember Joshua? Have not I commanded you, be strong and of good courage. You know, be not afraid. Don't be afraid. You're going into the land, okay? If he's afraid, right, and I would imagine if God is telling you that, there's, there's probably a little bit of nerves to Joshua. He's taking over for Moses that if he's afraid and if he allows that fear to control him, he is being slow to or refuse to obey a general specific command of God based upon real or perceived consequences. All right, all you got to do is go to, Pastor Joe talked about the 10 spies the other day. What are they struggling with? Fear, okay? Because they are refusing to obey a command of God based upon what they perceive as the consequences that are, they're, they're we're like grasshoppers in their sight. They're giants. And so that is a type of, well, I'm, I'm talking about biblical fear, that is wrong fear, and uh, allowing those circumstances to control us. Another definition, that we're going to come back to these two definitions here as we go. Biblical fear is mentally removing the presence and character of God from a circumstance and dreading the consequences due to that removal. Biblical fear is mentally removing the presence and character of God from a circumstance and dreading the consequences due to to that removal. I think this would ha this happened to a lot of us because we think that something is going to happen. We're afraid of something's going to happen, and what we have simply done is remove God and his character from that circumstance, and now we're afraid of what's going to happen because we have not seen God in that circumstance. We've taken him out of that circumstance, and now we start to have all sorts of consequences come to our mind. What's going to happen if? What's going to happen here? What's going to happen there? And we're allowing fear to control us because we have taken God out of the picture and made up all sorts of consequences. Are you with me? So that's, that's fear, all right? 
Okay, so the first type of fear we saw was kind of like a phobia, a consistent fear. But now as we keep these definitions in mind, let's go to, well, we're going to look at scripture and a continual fear. Continual fear, otherwise known as worry. So we have consistent fear, which happens every time we're in a certain circumstance. When I see a clown, I freak out. Okay, that's a consistent fear, right? But I don't, I mean, not, not me, I don't care about clowns, but if I was afraid of clowns, I don't stay up every night and worry that I'm going to see a clown the next day. Okay? Uh, only when I see a clown am I afraid, or only when I'm on an airplane when I'm afraid. Only when I see a spider am I afraid. I don't worry about spiders all night. But when it comes to continual fear, that's a little different. There's something that controls us that we, causes us to worry often. Not in necessarily in specific circumstances, but because of things that might be coming up or that have happened. Okay, So continual fear is worry. Now, I'm not going to re-preach. I've preached a message here that is basically all worry. right? So I'm not going to re-preach it, but I am going to borrow some things from that message. Okay, So Matthew chapter 6, you can turn with me, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, 25, you know, this is Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is talking. Verse 25, he says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? The words take no thought mean to be anxious or to be troubled with cares. Okay, to be anxious or to be troubled with cares, I think that would fall in the category of fear, worry, right? Same place, the same thing in Philippians chapter 4, it says, be careful for nothing, or don't be anxious or troubled for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Luke chapter 10, it talks about Martha, Jesus is talking to Martha, and he said, thou art careful and troubled about many things. So the idea is we are anxious and troubled, allowing those things to continually come back in our mind about certain subjects or things taking place in our life. I mean, right now, we can be constantly, as Jesus says here, what are you worried about? You're going to drink, what's, what's going to be good for your body, what you're going to put on, is not the life more than meat. You and I, there's a lot to worry about right now. I mean, gas is just out the roof, all right? Uh, all of us, I think, at some point in the last month or two have probably thought a couple times about driving somewhere because we've got to save a little bit of gas money. And sometimes that can control us, a continual fear about where the money is going to come from to put gas in the car. Okay, that's worry. That's worry. Jesus says, you can think about life all you want, but you're not going to change your, you can't change your stature. You can't change, uh, obviously, you've got to be a good steward. Obviously, you've got to plan, but there's certain things that you can think about enough and all the time, and it's not going to change anything. No matter how hard I think about gas prices, they're not going to change anything. <laughs> President Biden does not care about me, all right? Um, he's not going to listen to me. So it, I can think about that all night. I can think about some situations with my kids all night. I, I can think about what's going to happen with my job all night. That is a continual fear. It's, it's worry. It's allowing that. I'm being anxious. I'm taking too much thought. We're gonna, I, next week, we're going to talk about a solution, obviously, to fear. But I'm going to give you a sneak peek. And the way to combat worry is to remember what Jesus said in verse 33 right here in this passage. He said this, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. So how do you take care of continual fear and worry? Seek those things which are above, and God will take care of everything else. If you put him first, if you have a passion for the Lord, he'll take care of everything else. Okay, so continual fear is worry. And we're not going to park there very long either, okay? Um, we're going to get to the third type of fear, all right, in my categories. Uh, so... We have consistent fear. That happens every time that we're in a certain situation. There's a spider. There's heights. Uh, there's, there's continual fear, and that is we're allowing something to control us. We're allowing something to cause us to be careful and troubled about many things when really we should give it to the Lord because 
he's going to clothe us, all right, because he loves us. We're better than sparrows is what he said. And the third one that we're going to park on for a while, and that is circumstantial fear. Circumstantial fear. Consistent fear, all right. Then we have continual fear, which is worry. But this is circumstantial fear. Basically, just I'm going to put a bunch of things in this category. It is not, uh, it is not a phobia. Okay? It's not a spider. It's not heights. It is not something that I continually worry about. Right? I, I haven't stayed up late the last few nights thinking about this. It is something that takes place in my life, and I, my heart begins to race. I begin to think about the consequences of what's going to happen, and so it's different circumstances that take place in my life. And I think a lot of us fall into this category where something comes up in our life, and, and we begin to fear, and we need to give it to the Lord. All right? Again, let's go back over our definitions. Biblical fear is being slow to or refusing to obey a general or specific command of God based upon real or perceived consequences. Biblical fear is mentally removing the presence and character of God from a circumstance and dreading the consequences due to that removal. Now, one of the stories that has to do with that circumstantial fear and that fear of removing God from that circumstance and dreading the consequences Remember in Mark chapter 4 when Jesus is asleep on the pillow in the boat? Okay. And uh, which, by the way, when you're thinking about that story, Jesus is a human, right? Obviously. And he's asleep on a boat that's in the water, tossed. Man, I, I can barely fall asleep at night. Yeah, he's, on a, he's asleep on a boat that's in a storm. I've always thought that's amazing that he could be sleeping all through that. Um, but anyway, so his disciples are saying, Master, don't you care that we're about to perish? Jesus rebukes the wind and says, peace be still. Now, what was his answer to those disciples? Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Which, by the way, if you want a, a good title, you can have Elizabeth Schur is Faith Over Fear. Basically, fear is the opposite of faith, right? Fear is the enemy of faith. And Jesus said, why are you so fearful? I'll, I, maybe I could tell you why. Because they mentally removed the presence and the presence and character of God physically there with them, and then thought about the consequences of their removing Him, and now they're afraid that they're going to die when Jesus is right there. Okay, and we do that, right? We do that all the time. Jesus says, "I am with you always. I've never leave you nor forsake you." But we come upon a circumstance and we remove God from the circumstance. And then we begin to fear all the consequences that come because we removed God from said circumstance, right? Jesus said, why are you so fearful? I, I've been right here the whole time. I've been right here. And so he reproaches the apost uh, apostles for their fear, right? Um, now, as we, we're going to look at several different uh, circumstantial fears in the Bible. And uh, keep in mind that there are more, perhaps, but I kind of just tried to categorize them as best I could, right? We're going to look more at this again next week. What do we do with fear? But I want you to keep in mind, I preached a few weeks ago, or uh, now it's a few months ago here. I haven't been here in a few months. Um, about Jehoshaphat. Remember the host that was coming against Jehoshaphat? And he was afraid because of the numbers that they had? And what does the Bible say? Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. So it's kind of like a temptation. In other words, temptations are going to come to you and I. We can't, as Martin Luther said, you can't, uh, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head. But you can certainly keep it from making a nest in your hair. So fear is going to come to us. The problem is we allow fear to make a nest in our hair. And so Jehoshaphat, he's fe he fears. There's a big host coming. But instead of allowing that fear to control him, the Bible says he sets himself to seek the Lord. And he goes to the Lord. Okay, well, we'll look more at that next week. But keep that in mind, all right? So... Here's a few circumstances where you and I are going to be afraid, okay? There's a few circumstances, like it doesn't happen all the time. It's not something we worry about all the time, uh, but things will happen. And the first one, oh, that's small writing. I thought it was a lot bigger, okay? But uh, the first circumstances would just be a general uh, category, I'd say man, okay, man. Physically, physically, here's what the Bible says. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. So when you're looking at physically, David, obviously, and his running from Saul and the people that would pursue him, of course he's afraid 
And uh, he says, but I'm not going to be afraid of them, because what can man do unto me? What can they do to me? Okay, physically, yes, they can attack me physically. Okay, they can kill me, right, whatever. But what can they do unto me? I'm not going to be afraid. Now, I think more of us fall into the second category besides physically. What about just, you know, spiritually or personally? The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Again, a circumstantial fear. Uh, I don't think you and I necessarily walk around all the time being afraid of what people think. But there's many times in our life when we do. <laughs> when, you're sit- when you're standing there talking to somebody and they say something to you or you have to react a certain way and you're afraid of what they're going to say or what, th- or what they're going to say, boom, right then, that's a circumstance. When you're afraid of man and that brings a snare, it changes the way how you're going to react. It changes the- what you're going to say to those people because you're afraid of what they're going to say or what they're going to think. This happens a lot to us. I would fr- I- this happens a lot to me. As I'm traveling all over the country, this circumstantial fear can, it can bring, a, bring a snare. That I'm afraid of, again, what, remember what Pastor Bethay used to say, I have one person to please and nothing to prove, right? I'm not out here to prove anything to anybody. Why am I afraid of proving myself to these people? I'm just going to be who God created me to be. But a lot of times we find ourselves fearing man, fearing what they think, what they say. Again, what can they do? What can they do? So, Man, as first circumstantial fear, we're afraid of people, what they might do to us physically, what they might do us to us spiritually. They cause us to react differently, okay? How about this one? A host. Okay, that's a Bible term in Psalm 27, 3. Though a host and host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Okay, so you can put that in the category of man too, okay? Uh, here is a host coming after. Uh, I love the story in 2 Kings chapter 6 uh, with Elisha. The servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth. Behold, a host come past the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? What are we going to do? There's a huge host coming against us. Elisha says, Fear not. Now, you can apply this however you want. I mean, you can go back to man afraid of man and what they think, but a host, I, I think if you want to apply this in our day and age, it's just something that comes up against you where you're overwhelmed, <laughs> okay? Decisions on a daily basis or whatever it is to where there's no, you're, it's just coming at you. <laughs> there's just so much to take in. And a host, it's coming, and what, what am I going to do? What are we going to do? Elisha says, fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Or you can think about it satanically, okay? Uh, Satan is coming after me, and Satan is discouraging me, and Satan uh, is all these fiery darts are coming at me. What am I going to do? How do I react? Fear not. They that be with us are more than they be with them, okay? God is on our side. The Lord will fight for us. If you want to put it, look at it that way, okay? Again, in all of these verses, it has the word fear and afraid, and just kind of breaking it up. In the category. So fear not. Don't fear the host. Don't fear that which comes against you in waves. Don't fear. Uh, yes, obviously we should respect Satan and, and what he can do, but uh, our trust is in the Lord. Our trust is in the Lord. He will work on our behalf. Okay, how about this one? Earth moving. <laughs> Psalm 46, 2. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of of the sea. As I was studying and as, as I looked at this, you've heard this verse since you were young. But think about this literally. That you and I don't have to fear even if the earth is removed. <laughs> We'd be out of here. Okay, let's just say that that doesn't happen. Let's just say that you're outside and you're looking at the beautiful mountains, you're on a hike or something, and you're looking up and you see all these great mountains, and they literally, the mountains are carried into the midst of the sea. Don't you think your palms would sweat a little bit if you saw the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea? Probably, okay, a little dopamine going on at that point. But we don't have to fear that. We don't have to fear that. Though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. In other words, something great is happening in my life, and I don't know exactly what to do, I heard a message uh, while we were traveling where he said, I may not know what to do, but I know what to do. 
In other words, he was saying, I may not know what to do in this situation as far as solving the problem, but I know what to do. I'm going to my God. <laughs> it was good. It was good. I needed it. Uh, though the mountains be carried in the Mississippi, I don't know exactly what to do because the mountains are falling all around me. The earth is being removed, but I do know what to do. I'm not going to fear. I'm not going to fear because I serve a great God. And so earth moving. How about this one? Restitution. I, you can't really see it very well. Retribution. My bad. Thank you, sir. I don't even know my own notes. Retribution. I have it right here. Retribution and reward, okay? Um, Genesis chapter 15 talks about Abraham, all right? And Abraham gathers his servants, and he goes and rescues Lot, okay, from some kings, and it kind of gives us the idea that he's a little nervous as to what's going to happen because of that, all right? In Genesis 15, 1, it says this, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Abram had just defeated a much larger army, okay, five kings. He had a reason to be afraid because he could be attacked out of retribution. But he also was wondering, God, what are you going to give me? And his reward, obviously, you know that he was given a son, right? And so he says, don't be afraid. I am your shield. I am your exceedingly great reward. So if you want to think of this practically as for us, okay, well, I do something that is right. I serve God. I, I, I please God, and I'm doing exactly what God has called me to do. But somebody is not happy with what I'm doing. Somebody's not going right with what I'm doing. And it's just not all going the way that's supposed to. And I'm afraid of what's going to happen. You don't have to be afraid. God is your shield. He's exceeding great reward. If you had nothing else, if all the mountains around you fell into the sea, if everything was taken from you, you still have God as your reward. You still have God. You're exceeding great reward. Abraham say, uh, God says, Abraham, I, I'm enough. I'm enough. All right, how about this one? O obedience. Uh, again, we're going back to what Pastor Joe talked about in Sunday school a few weeks ago. Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers has said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. Go in and possess the land. Can we go back to our definition? Let me see if I can find it, okay? Uh, way back here. Biblical fear is being slow to or refusing to obey a general or specific command of God based upon real or perceived consequences. Again, don't you think that's where those people were in that position? They were afraid to go in. Their hearts were discouraged because they were outnumbered. They say they're outmanned, and uh, they were disobedient. Fear sometimes will lead to disobedience. When we do not trust God, it leads to disobedience. He says, um, Ye rebelled against the command of the Lord your God, and you murmured in your tents, because the Lord hates us. He brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites and destroy us. And so it leads to unbelief. Fear leaves unbelief, it leaves discouragement. All right, so obedience. How about this one, evil tidings? Psalm chapter 112, verse 7. I love this verse. Psalm 112, 7, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. You guys, maybe I'm the only parent that does this, and I've mentioned already in the message, you ever just get overwhelmed with what could happen to your children? <laughs> or what could happen to your family, or what could happen in this situation. What we're doing is we're afraid of evil. It's almost like we're sitting around waiting for something bad to happen. You don't have to have kids for this to take place either. You're just afraid of something bad's going to happen to your wife, or so something bad's about to happen. We're, still, we're just sitting around and worry about that stuff. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. So we're not supposed to sit around and, and, and wait for evil tidings. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 25, it's not up there. It says, Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord, thy God, for the Lord shall be thy confidence and, the, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. I like how it says, Be not afraid of sudden fear. I mean, have you, or again, it's just me perhaps, but have you just been sitting somewhere and your mind is not really focused on something? Maybe it hasn't happened to you ladies because you ladies are always doing something, okay? Maybe us men do this, okay? Sitting around and something just, boom, hits you and it just causes you to fear. That's a sudden fear. Like, 
that could happen. That guy could say that. This could happen at work. It's just a sudden fear that comes, and you had no idea where it came from. Again, that could be satanic, right? But don't be afraid of sudden fear. <laughs> don't be afraid of sudden. I think God says not to be afraid of fear. Don't fear fear, all right? Although, what's his, fate? What's his name? He said the only, thing, the only thing we should fear is fear itself, right? Um, I forget who said that. I think I have it at the end of my message somewhere, all right? Um, how about this one? Psalm chapter 91. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Interesting that the psalmist would say not to be afraid of the terror by night and for the arrow, arrow that flies by day. But until studying for this message, I never noticed that. Notice the difference? The terror by night and the arrow that flies by day. One's not, one is mental, one is physical. So during the day, there's arrows flying. I should probably be afraid of arrows. That's probably a good fear. I'm going to get my shield up. Okay, that makes sense. But at night, there's terror. I, I mean, I just, you, maybe, I, I don't know if you're like me again, but uh, sometimes I still wake up and I hear noises, <laughs> right? And I'm a little afraid of what that is, all right? Um, and sometimes I have a hard time going back to sleep because I feel like I still keep hearing those noises. But terror by night. The terror by night is those things that we perceive to be going to take place the next day or that took place that day, and we're afraid of what's going to come on. It's going to take place. Terror by night, okay? And the arrow that flies by day. Notice the difference, all right? How about this one? The greatest fear, death. Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So all of these things that we've talked about up to this point, the greatest of these that you and I could fear, people may not like us, there's probably a host that might come against us, there's things that aren't going right, but when it comes to death, that would be the greatest thing that you and I could fear. But even in that, we don't have to fear the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. I don't know if I'm planning on giving this illustration and see if I can get it right. There was a, a, a famous preacher that uh, I think his wife had died, and uh, he had children that were still left, and I think they were driving or something, and a, a big truck had come by, and the shadow of the truck just fell on the car, and uh, he said something about, um, you know, is that something that you and I should be afraid of is the shadow? The kids are, no, it's just the shadow. It's not going to hurt you. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Because the end result, really, of us when we die, <laughs> for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So why would I fear death when I will be ushered into the presence of my Savior forever in that death, right? So there's nothing for me to fear. And, by, and anyways, what the verse is saying is I have my shepherd here anyways, even if I was to, to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm going to fear no evil. So, um, that's what we're going to talk about for this week, all right? Uh, we will go back and talk about um, some interesting things to do with fear and discouragement. How do those come about, all right? Uh, some things that I found when it comes to uh, discouragement. But again, let me leave you with these are two definitions. If you want to go through and look through Scripture when it comes to fear and afraid, you're going to find a lot of these have to do with one of these two um, definitions. That is being slow to or refusing to obey a general or specific command of God based upon real or perceived consequences. That's fear. I don't want to do it. Or removing the presence and character of God from a circumstance and dreading the consequences due to that removal. Uh, so that's fear. So anytime you're going to have victory over something, all right, as I tell my, uh, tell my inmates if I preach to them about having victory in Christ, for us to buy, be able to have victory over something, you've got to identify it as wrong, okay? We're not just having victory over something because we just want to have victory, okay? If we have fear, we've got to name it as what it really is. That's fear. And God says not to be afraid over and over and over again. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. If the mountains be removed, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And so next week we'll talk about, okay, I've identified my fear. It may fall into one of these two categories. 
Um, it's maybe not a phobia, maybe it's just a circumstantial thing that comes up. Okay, so now I, I've named it at what, is, what it really is. So now what do I do? What takes place? All right? And so we'll go over that next week. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you. Uh, thank you that we have nothing to fear uh, tonight. Uh, Lord, all of us at some point, even the rest of this week, we will come across something that causes our, our heart rate to go up, causes us perhaps to lose some sleep. Lord, that is fear. That is worry. Something we dread. Many times, Lord, would you forgive us for us removing the character and the presence of God from a situation and then magnifying the results of that, that we, we fear things coming up because we don't trust the God of the future. So, Lord, help us to rest in you. Lord, again, thank you that we can go and dig in your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.